So what is interferometry? Uh, typically that requires a picture like this. Uh, this is a two element interferometer, right? Where you have two antennas. Um, some terminology here, we refer to the uh, vector, which points from one antenna to another antenna as a baseline. So just so you know, when I say baseline, I'm referring to that vector, not just the distance per se, but the vector that points from one to the other. Um, we delay one of the antennas depending on which direction we want to look at because we want all the phases to line up at least at one frequency uh, along the line here. I'm not sure why that just happened. The, um, so there's a delay. Um, you, then you do the correlation, right? And the correlation is just multiplying and integrating. Uh, the output of that is what we refer to as a visibility. So when I say visibility, I'm talking about a correlation. They, they are uh, synonyms. The sensitivity of an interferometer is somewhat important to know. Um, if you have a two element interferometer, the, radiometer, the, radio, the radiometry equation is, uh, the radiometer equation is the same. Uh, you just increase the SNR by square root of two because now you have two independent observations. As you add antennas, uh, you get more sensitivity. Let's just forget about imaging for a minute. You get more sensitivity and it goes like this. If you have N antennas, you have n squared possible ways to form these correlations. That's n squared possible visibilities. But n of those are the antenna correlated with itself. You get no additional information from that. Uh, and then half of the remainder are the same baseline, just in different directions. So uh, this baseline is the same as the same baseline pointing in the opposite direction. No new information there. So we say we've got n times n minus 1 divided by two independent baselines. So the radiometer equation is the single element or single antenna radiometer equation times this factor of the square root of n squared minus n. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's that. This is not the whole story though. Um, I will return to this time permitting. Uh, aperture synthesis imaging is the technique that's used by modern radio, radio uh, interferometers to form images. And it's not uh, what you might first think. So I, I find that engineers in particular immediately assume that interferometry is some kind of beam forming. And it's not really that. Uh, and the best way I know to explain that is uh, uh, I fall back on my signal processing comfort zone. Uh, if you are also someone who spends a lot of time thinking about signal processing, this will make sense to you. If you don't think about signal processing, I'm talking about the sophomore level, uh, this will be mysterious to you as the original problem. But this is the way I think about it. Um, let's not think about aperture sensitive imaging. Let's think instead about um, uh, just uh, time and frequency. So if you have a pulse in time, you take the Fourier transform, you get a sync function, right? Every engineer knows this. In fact, if you take magnitude squared of that sync function, you get sync squared, which is the power spectral density of that uh, pulse. But you can get the same result by uh, computing the correlation of this thing, right? Sliding that pulse past itself, that gives you a triangle, right? And these are no longer times, these are lags or delays, right? So the center is zero delay, that's the pulse on top of itself. And then any other time is a lag where the pulse is not overlapping. So you get a triangular spectrum. And if you take the Fourier transform that, you get the power spectral density. So two ways to get to power spectral density, the one that most people normally think of right away. And then there's this other way we can do uh, correlation, get the lag spectrum, and then take the Fourier transform of that, right? Aperture synthesis is based on a dual of that, and I mean a rigorous mathematical dual of that thing. Uh, time and frequency are duals with position in space and spatial frequency. The spatial frequency is direction. So if I replace time with position in an aperture, and I replace frequency with spatial frequency, which is just direction, then I get the same relationship. So if I have a uniformly illuminated aperture, this is one dimension, I get a beam. And a beam has a sync pattern. In fact, this is why beams from large reflectors look like sync, is because they are Fourier transforms of approximately uniform aperture distributions. And of course, I can figure out the power spectrum, the power spatial power density of a beam by taking magnitude squared. I get something like sync squared. And that's the image. So this is beam forming and this is imaging, right? That's, uh, that's uh, uh, hopefully not too hard to see. But just like before, I can take another route. I can do the correlation and compute the lag spectrum. But in imaging, the lag spectrum is baseline, right? So what I've actually done is plotted correlation as a function of the baseline, the separation between the two antennas, 
right? So for two antennas that are right next to each other or the same antenna, I get a big lag, the autocorrelation, or a big uh, correlation, that's the autocorrelation. And as the antennas move apart, they decorrelate, right? And if I take the Fourier transform that, I get an image, right? So it turns out that uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, this is the hard way to go. And this is the easy way to go. In fact, if you sparsely populate or you sparsely sample a large aperture, you really have to go this way. It becomes intractable to go the other way. So what aperture th synthesis imaging is, and here's my 1D version of it, is you have, for example, two element interferometer. Let me just start there. If you have two element interferometer, you have two samples in position. Uh, you get one unique baseline, and that might be measuring that location right there. And if you Fourier transform an impulse, we all know that you get uniform magnitude and a phase, which is, corresponds to the delay here, right? So the delay is large, you get a big phase variation, uh, a big slope. If you have a small delay, you get a small slope. But that one baseline provided one piece of information about the image. And then as you add a third one, you get two additional baselines. That means you get two more samples here, which means now you have three contributions here, each with a, new, a different magnitude and a different phase slope. And as you continue to populate or you continue to sample this aperture, you get more and more of these things adding up. And if you add up enough of them, eventually you get some facsimile of the image. And that's what aperture synthesis imaging is. This seems simple, but this turns out to be very complex primarily because the aperture has to be sampled so sparsely that you typically have extremely cruddy information here. And astronomers have become experts in figuring out how to take very inadequate amount of information here, figuring out how to turn that into an image that has uh, significance. To demonstrate, it's kind of a shame that I go from that to kind of one of the iconic results of all of aperture synthesis imaging, but uh, because it makes it seem too easy, but here is, a very, uh, uh, very exciting result, uh, for example. So this is a radio galaxy. Um, if you look at the, uh, in the optical spectrum, it's not too interesting, it's another galaxy. Of course, I say that not being an optical astronomer, but the um, if you look at the radio, it's doing something phenomenal and it's blowing out these gigantic jets uh, in, in opposite directions. And these gigantic jets are, are you know, highly accelerated charged particles out here. They're kind of being spread out by the intergalactic medium. So just an enormously interesting thing happening here. And then all kinds of clues out here, not only about what the source is doing, but also about what is going on out here in terms of uh, the intergalactic medium. So uh, of great interest, uh, this source is uh, you know, just arc minutes wide. In fact, the field of view here is uh, three by two arc minutes, An arc minute being uh, 1 16th of a degree. Right, so the um, data set that was required to produce this intensity image this is an intensity image. That was 70 hours of observations, not all done at once. They all had to be done you know, over many, many times. And I'll explain more about that in a moment, hopefully. Uh, from 4.2 to nine gigahertz over an entire, entire frequency range. Not the whole frequency range at once, but using, uh, I will guarantee you a big fraction of that entire range in, uh, at different times. Uh, and then putting this all together to get this extraordinary resolution of just uh, just 0.3 arc seconds, just just remarkable. Uh, if you haven't seen the VLA before, this is the thing that made the uh, measurement. And again, it's one of those two iconic telescopes I mentioned. These are all 25 meter dishes, 25 meter dishes arranged in a Y shape. Each dish is 25 meters in diameter. So we are quite far away from this thing. In fact, uh, this baseline here is on the order of, uh, I can't remember exactly, it's on the order of kilometers. Uh, all these dishes can be moved. Uh, if you want to see something truly remarkable, watch a 25 meter dish move. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite a th thing to behold, but this whole thing is, is movable. And in its widest configuration, the longest baseline is 36 kilometers. So you always see it in its smallest configuration because it's the only way you can get the whole thing into frame. Uh, in its biggest configuration is spread out over tens of kilometers. So what it took to make this image was not just the 27 times 27 minus one baselines that you get from this, but a multitude additional sets of baselines that they get from spreading these out in different configurations, continuing to build up that sampling of the aperture, always in terms of new baselines. 
And that's what makes this technique of aperture synthesis imaging so powerful is you don't have to do beam forming. You have to get the whole thing at once. You can collect baselines one at a time and put them all together at a later time. Uh, that's why it gets done this way. I should mention this term of correlator. Uh, correlation kind of makes sense, I think, in the term I just explained it. Uh, but when you're hanging around a group of astronomers, you mentioned a correlator, that's probably not exactly what they mean. Um, modern use of that term, or the colloquial use of that term, is uh, a spectrometer, which also does correlation on every one of the uh, FFT channels. So um, most modern correlators follow this architecture where you have a spectrometer part, that's the F part of FX, uh, and then you have a correlation part, which is the X part of FX, so an FX spectrometer is something which looks at each baseline, breaks it up into small frequency chunks, and then cor cross correlates the frequency chunks to produce a dynamic spectrum for one baseline. And then you collect all those baselines. So I say this is simplified because this is all the plumbing associated with just one baseline. If you have thousands of baselines, this gets repeated thousands of times. And these things become formidable chunks of computing. Um, the correlator for the, for the VLA takes up a whole room and uh, it, it's just racks and racks and racks of computing. And uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the things that actually limits modern astronomy, just how big you can make these things and simultaneously have sufficiently fine time frequency resolution. Um, quite an interesting digital uh, engineering challenge. And I should emphasize it's not neither or proposition. It's not like you're doing imaging or spectral line imaging. Uh, you can do both. And here's an example of a, um, uh, once again, I just happened to throw in another example of a star here. This particular star, you can observe lots of chemistry going on. So you can observe uh, hydroxyl, you can observe uh, water, you can observe uh, uh, SIO. Uh, they're all different spectral lines. Here they've all been lined up by, again, converting them to velocities. And then by imaging at each one of these frequencies, you can see not only an image, but you can see image the individual uh, chemical components of what's going on here. So you can learn an enormous amount about what's going on here by determining where the hydroxyl is, determining where uh, the um, water is, and so on. You really can tease apart a lot of information about these things, despite you know the small angular extent and the rather limited information you get in some sense in the radio. That was, uh, that's VLA stuff. Um, uh, that's distinct from VLBI. VLBI is very long baseline interferometry. So uh, just to show the difference, this is another iconic image. Uh, this case, Cygnus A, another radio galaxy that also produces these, uh, these jets and these big old lobes out here. Um, uh, this is made with a VLA. Um, to get inside here is beyond the capability of the VLA. That's the core of the galaxy. You really wanna know what's going on there. To resolve that, you need a much larger aperture, much larger than baselines uh, on the order of tens of kilometers. Uh, so you can make an image like this. And this is an image of just the core here made with a very long baseline array. VLBA is the instrument. The technique used by the VLBA is VLBI, just to untangle the nomenclature here. So this is 10, uh, 25 meter dishes, they look very similar. Dishes look very similar to VLA dishes. Uh, they're distributed across the continental United States. There's one in Hawaii, there's one in the Virgin Islands. Um, and that gives you the kind of baselines that you need to do this. But the problems just pile up when you do this. Um, keeping all these dishes coherent is one problem. Um, uh, and and um, uh, there are more. This just kind of shows you why both these techniques are important. Uh, I promise you something about the VLA, next generation VLA. Uh, this is not an instrument which exists. Uh, it's an instrument in, uh, I'd say, in an advanced state of development, uh, not yet deployment. Uh, hard to say whether it's going to happen like this or not, but it seems likely that something like this will happen in the next couple decades. It might not be exactly this. So the current concept for the NGVLA is uh, not 25, but 200 dishes. A little bit smaller, 18 meters as opposed to 25 meters for a number of good reasons. In addition to a whole bunch of smaller dishes, which are six meter in diameter, on short baselines. And now you know. You know why you might want short baselines and not just very long baselines, because you want the diversity of baselines that lets you get the best image quality. So 
Uh, these 200 dishes are spread across the Southwest over many states, not just New Mexico, but also into Texas. And uh, uh, I think they go into Mexico. They're also putting these out in uh, uh, you know, across the continental United States and Canada, and again, Hawaii and Virgin Islands. Um, the uh, frequency range, 1.2 gigahertz to 116 gigahertz. I think that's to capture the CO line, which is about 115 gigahertz. Uh, probably excluding a big chunk of 50 to 75 gigahertz for reasons that are probably apparent to most people in this audience. Uh, this is a slide that gets passed or, or a picture that gets passed around a lot these days because it's so exciting. Um, this is sensitivity versus frequency for the current um, uh, VLA. This is a microjanski. So here you're seeing 50 microjanskis, and it goes up like this. Uh, the um, uh, for the uh, uh, for Alma, which I haven't talked about at all because it's not in North America, but it's certainly an important millimeter wave telescope. Uh, you can see higher frequencies, and this is what its sensitivity looks like. For the NGVLA, the associated curves would be these. So dramatic improvement in sensitivity associated with the collecting area, but you also get the uh, improvement in uh, resolution due to the long baselines. And then superimposed on here are uh, a particular our spectral lines associated with CO transitions uh, for a particular source. So this imagined, well, it's natural source, but it's uh, just one arbitrary, arbitrarily chosen one. The redshift of five, which is very distant. That's a galaxy that's out there. Uh, redshift of five shifts to 115 gigahertz down to 20 gigahertz, just to give you an idea how much Doppler shift there is associated with that. So that uh, CO line shows up here. Uh, current VLA has no chance of seeing it. NGVLA should be see, able to see it. In fact, I think it's designed to be able to see it. Um, and then you see other carbon lines here, or CO lines, which are uh, ordinarily would be hard to see at the rest frequencies, but because for distant galaxies, they would be in this frequency range, they are now observable. So um, uh, gives you, again, now at this point, you should have some idea how these sensitivities work and what typical sources are, what, why these particular lines, for example, show up as being important. 